So, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, John and Brenda, who is with me for, for inviting me. It's my first time in China, and I have to say that I'm, I'm more than impressed by what I have seen already in one day. <laughs> uh, it's really remarkable. And, uh, you know, when I was a president, uh, I went west to learn a rhythmic stoma in Los Angeles. But definitely I would advise my, my young residents to go east now <laughs> to come in and learn and learn here because it's just fantastic. So uh, I will share with you uh, some of our experience. It's uh, also for me a time to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, Francesco Cuccinelli is a, is a intellectual radiologist. It is a real uh, magician, uh, I must say. Maya is a pediatric oncologist, and Marita Gaillard is my uh, is an ocular oncologist as well. So I just start with this slide just to remind the four seating compartments uh, with this uh, uh, fairly amazing behavior of retinal blastoma, which can grow solid as a retinal tumor can grow as a semi-solid tumor in, in, the, in the vitreous cavity or even as a liquid tumor in the retro yellowidal space where there is a yellow detachment or the separate uh, compartment when retina detaches or even when it you know, invades the, the, the acres anteriorly. So as we know the, the goals of retinal plasma treatment is to save life, to conserve the eye or the eyes, to preserve visual function if possible. And I think the fourth objective is also very important to, to maintain a quality of light, of life, through the, the treatment um, time, because it can last quite a lot of, of time, but also for the, for, the, for the lifetime of these patients, because we are dealing with very young patients. So let's see very briefly where we are with the uh, first objective. Obviously, we are fairly good. As you know, we have a like 98% survival rate in, in our countries. Uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> preservation of the eye, this is the ABC. I have to, to now to, to converse this into yes. the TNM. Yes. But uh, basically, we, we treat patients from A to, to D. Uh, taking advantage of this so-called metastatic grace period that we can uh, use to uh, treat safely our patient as safely as possible. Of course, when it comes to E, uh, it's very clear E is for annihilation, and uh, we annihilate the eyes uh, with the E uh, group. So we, uh, of course, as all of, uh, of us, you know. Perform the, uh, the systemic chemo initially uh, with two to five monthly infusion and combined with, uh, with focal treatments. So, in the next talk, I will briefly touch these uh, this, uh, modalities of treatment, focal treatment. So, with this in hand, with the intravenous, before 2009, uh, where, when we introduced intraarterial in Lausanne. Uh, here's, for example, for unilateral group D eyes, the time to success. <laughs> so you see that after one year, we had only half of the patients with uh, tumor free eyes and controlled eyes. It can take up to two years to control fully a D eye. If we take all our patients, H to D with intravenous without excellent being ready therapy, the success rate, the survival was 95%, 92 95% for A to C eyes and less than 60% for D eyes. And it's very straightforward. The explanation is as long as you deal with a solid tumor that is which is vascularized as a blood supply, you can be successful with intravenous uh, infusion of the drugs. Whereas when it comes to DIs where you have 
invasion of other compartments, uh, compartments which are non-solid, avascular, and hypoxic. You have a resistance. And the answer to improve this, of course, is to perform in situ, uh, in situ uh, uh, chemotherapy to increase the uh, viability of the drug at, at, uh, at low potency. So intra-arterial and intra-vitreal chemotherapy. So here's the, the survivor group, as you saw a minute ago, from group D. And uh, there is one paper, the paper of Abramson in 2014, uh, which compared the ocular survival according to the seeding pattern of the D. And uh, at two year follow up survival, at two year, uh, Bramson reported. 82-83% survival for several seeding using intraarterial, but it was quite disappointing for intravitreal seeding because this, the survival was 65% something like that, 66% with intra seeding. So there's uh, a big difference between the two, and this is just related to the fact that injecting the methylene in the artery, uh, the vitreous will barely, if ever, reach the IC50 dose, as shown here. It's a graphic from Shankevich, Carla Shankevich, who did the fantastic work of uh, pharmacokinetics of all the drugs we use in, in uh, retinal glassoma. So, of course, to overcome this problem of uh, anti-tumor effect in the vitreous, uh, there is a need to introduce um, uh, also intravitreal. And here's the two curves of the Lausanne uh, cohort with, a, with a intra -vitre, intra -vitre venous or systemic chemotherapy. When you introduce intra uh, arterial and intra venous, you are at 90% survival for group D eyes. So, a big jump uh, for the survival of the eyes. Something totally unprecedented uh, in my experience, of course. And even for the A to C eyes, it's even slightly better, but not significantly better. So this is the type of eyes, the eyes that we were uh, manipulating at the time, and you see the final result here with the visus of uh, 0.4, or eyes like that with a, even a normal vision. So what is even more, in my views, even or more uh, impressive is that in terms of quality of life of these patients, we increase significantly the quality of life. Look here, the time to success. You remember I showed you the for DIs. Here we're talking about DIs. If we look the time to success using intravenous, it was up to two years of active treatments. Whereas now it's divided by two. So uh, by one year we have achieved complete tumor control in all the treated and retained eyes. So if, moreover, if we look at the vision in these patients, we found that, and here we have plotted the, the number of lines lost in comparison to the control lateral eyes. And we have focused here only on unilateral patients. To, not inter to have no confounding effect. And you see that very clearly, with the intra-arterial, you have a better visual outcome. <coughs> Significantly better. Not only uh, uh, have we uh, achieved better visual outcome, but all also here we have put up the, the referral to, to Lausanne by slices of five years. It starts, you know, when I started my practice in '86, and up to now, and you see that the proportion of eyes that require external beam radiation has reduced. It is the, the green, the light green, and the dark red. You see that this proportion decreases, and now we don't have irradiated a single eye. For, uh, for retinal blastoma since uh, 2006, 2011. So, 
eradication of XLB is fantastic, really. It's something that I would not even believe uh, was possible, but it's true. Uh, uh, XLB is, is, in my views, uh, virtually eradicated from the armamentarium operating system. In terms of enucleation also, we have much less enucleation than before. And although we have more secondary enucleation, that's, that's true, but there is uh, much less enucleation uh, and also a decreased need of intravenous. So all of this, in terms of quality of life, is certainly something, uh, an improvement, significant improvement. Since we have extended the limits of conservative therapy, we have improved the prognosis for eye preservation and visual outcome. <coughs> Eradication of XMB, and also reduce the need of, of uh, uh, the, the, the duration of the treatment. I think also in terms of cost benefit, it's something significant. And finally, um, the the, the need for uh, intravenous also is, is restricted in, today. So what, what are the indications to intra-arterial in, in my views? Some of the proposal you will hear now are controversial, of course, but it's also a little bit provocative, we can discuss about it. So in terms of the first time, what we do in Lausanne, we do unilateral group B, C, and D, and uh, provided for the D, provided that the imaging has no evidence of exteriorization uh, uh, of the tumor. We also do bilateral as first line, provided that they are very asymmetrical, that one eye is accessible to focal treatment and the other uh, can be treated with uh, intra-arterial. Um, so, in terms of salvage, it will target all the relapse that are not amenable to a focal treatment. I mean by that, that an eye that requires a whole eye approach, because you, you, you would destroy the eye otherwise. It's too much to do to uh, several seeds or whatever. And I add also the localized tumor if they are located uh, on the macula, on the macula uh, papular bundle, or uh, are papillary tumors. Now, the last is, of course, controversial, and I, I wish I can hear about uh, your comments. As a neuroadjuvant, combined, of course, with intervents, to avoid, to, uh, to avoid, uh, to have uh, um, residue tumor as you enucleate these eyes. If you have uh, evidence of optic nerve invasion, I don't know, I never did it for uh, extrascleral extension, but it's something that can be discussed at least as a concept to you because so so efficient to reduce the tumor burden that is outside the eye before enucleating, of course, not going to, to avoid the intravenous uh, treatment afterwards or, or almost simultaneously, but it's, it's a matter of, of uh, it's a thought. We, we did not that because we, we're not exposed so much to such patients, but I wish I can hear your comments. So maybe we can discuss it right away. Yes, so please. To what extent of optic nerve invasion? Oh, yes. Would be the cut off? Have you Would be the cut off? No, it's never no. adjuvant. It's before inflation. Yeah. To, to, I, to, to be able to cut uh, uh, the tumor free. Touch. Yeah, and then, of course, we will go on, on with the intravenous process. But, uh, to prevent, it does not prevent intravenous. But because of the efficiency of the high dose you get in the, in the orbit, uh, it's, it's, it's a thought. So to what, what extent of optic nerve invasion uh, radiologically have you treated by in your treatment? So honestly, 
I have not treated patients with this because we don't. So up to now, I haven't seen uh, such a patient. But um, maybe it has a role in the future. I don't know. Because we see a lot of patients with optical limitations. Yes. Optical limitation varies like from a few millimeters to right to the orbital apex. Yeah, or even the plasma. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So we see a lot of these cases, and uh, we uh, when the uh, like uh, we usually have a protocol of treating these patients with neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by inhalation, and if you are and Irrespective of what we get on histopathology, we go ahead with uh, radiotherapy, external wave radiotherapy, and adjuvant chemotherapy. Right. The protocol that we use for orbital retinal yes. so, If we have cross optic nerve invasion on MRI, sometimes it so happens that MRI is like you know, uh, like equivocal. Not the sensitivity and specificity of MRI we know. detecting yeah. optic nerve invasion uh -huh. is not like hundred percent. So sometimes doubtful uh, invasion of the optic nerve on MRI, for instance, it's showing some enhancement, but it's not showing gross thickening. In those cases, we go for a primary nucleation, and then we look at the stump cutting of the optic nerve, and then we advise chemotherapy or adjuvant radiotherapy accordingly. And uh, the other thing is that sometimes we give, uh, so, and when we give systemic chemotherapy in these cases, uh, systemic chemotherapy tends to downstage the histopathology. So even after radiation, we don't have like high risk features on histopathology. We still continue to attach it in chemotherapy. Sounds very interesting. That's my yeah. experience yes, 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 with yes, optic nerve yes. invasion. Of course, when but I when sure I say evidence of optic nerve invasion, yeah. it would be a, you know, of course, orbital yes. in, in the orbit yes. of the orbital part of the nerve. Of course, not if it goes into into the optic. Uh, Yes, well, of course it's not. Uh, but anyway, you cannot you cannot avoid that. Uh, in this idea, you cannot avoid returns and make it also with therapy. If you if you have evidence with the pathology of you know uh, incomplete resection. I, I think it's an interesting idea, but they do yeah. they they, uh, uh, they do quite well on intravenous chemotherapy. As fact, we showed yesterday, followed by a nucleation when you got the response, and including the nerves that were involved, yes. keeping the tumor and the size of the nerve yeah. kept down. Everything responds to the systemic Yeah, so I must say, we have this experience yeah. as well with yes. intravenous, yes. but I never, we no. never did it have no protocol. Yeah. It's just an idea here. No. We, of course, we, had, we have patients with, it, yeah. with optic nerve involvement, yeah. and so far we have applied uh, the systemic yeah. approach. Have you irradiated all of those? If I do, you irradiate the orbit to for those. Uh, if the section is positive, yes. But if, but if you don't do primary surgery, no. Yeah, yeah. That's that's. Uh, so we need to you you irradiate. Do. And you also. We would irradiate. Yes. And what? What's your radiological evidence? We go with chemo and the radiation. So what? Uh, what part of the invasion will IAC cover? So like your role of IAC here is to treat what? The, the role is to treat the optic nerve because we know from, again, from Paula's work, Paula Shekovic's work, that the concentration mm -hmm. of metronum in the optic nerve is way higher than everywhere else in the, in the retina or elsewhere. And so we can expect a very, very potent uh, effect at this level. But of course, in the orbital portion of the nerve, not, not, uh, not further down. Well, this is <coughs> this is a favorite. nice to discuss. Thank you for, for your comments. So now I just give you a brief out, uh, view of the outcome of our experience. We have. Uh, Injected 123 patients, 137 eyes. The total number of injections in these patients is 344. So you will note immediately that the mean number per patient is low. I think there is no need to go for six, or some centers have introduced six, six injections. I don't know why, because it's maybe just a, a reminiscence of intravenous protocols. But in our hands, we do uh, 
a mean of two or eight or so ejections per pi. So we, in this uh, cohort, we have 49 bilateral, 74 unilateral. Uh, the, the grouping is as, as shown here. Uh, the indication was first line into 52 patients and uh, salvage in 75 patients. The mean follow up of this cohort is 2 to 28 months. We had 12, so far, 12 secondary manipulations, 4 with high risk histopathologic factors. On the manipulation? On the manipulation of the upon, you know, secondary manipulation. Of course, they all went to, uh, to uh, receive uh, adjunct chemo. Uh, radiotherapy, zero. Deaths <coughs> from metastasis, zero. And uh, metastatic disease, zero. We have two deaths uh, in this cohort. One due to uh, intravascular disseminated coagulation. In, it happens in, the, in his country of origin, sadly. Uh, because the patient was doing perfectly well, but he died from that. And we had one rhabdomyosarcoma, other rhabdomyosarcoma, and the patient died uh, just uh, a few weeks, a few months ago, uh, sadly. So, do you, now I will then touch intravitreal. Could I just ask about the rhabdomyosarcoma? Yeah. Because to me, I've never heard of rhabdomyosarcoma following retinoblastoma. But in the um, paper, the, the paper reporting 600 IAC from Japan, mm -hmm. it's a very significant proportion of rhabdomyosarcoma. Interesting. I wonder, you know, is there something about the imperial chemo yeah. at a young age that's Actually, triggering something? I, I can answer to this question quite clearly. Yes. Uh, because it's not related at all with methanol. Why? Because this patient actually happened to develop his alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. It was a twin from, uh, from Russia. Mm -hmm. um, and he was diagnosed at uh, two or three months of age with a coccyx alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, already with metastasis. And when they, they did the scan, uh, check the patient, they found that the eye had tumors as well. And they found, as they were screening the patient for the metastasis, they found that they had also bilateral retinoblastoma. Are you sure it was retinoblastoma? Absolutely, because I have treated this patient, <coughs> this arterial, and it was bilateral retinoblastoma. So it's, in my knowledge, the first case of uh, sarcoma before the diagnosis of retinoblastoma. Then they, they of course check his twin brother, and the twin brother has also bilateral retinoblastoma. So then we checked, we, we found a mutation in the RB gene, a, a germline mutation. Actually, the, the father was a mosaic for this mutation. And we also checked other genes, because how to, to uh, account for this uh, retinoblastoma. We checked P53, it was all, all negative. So now we're going to study the tumor itself, the rhabdomyosarcoma, because we had uh, we have samples of the of the metastasis and we can so this will So you don't know yet if the rhabdomyosarcoma had mutation of both RB1 genes. It's what I, I'm looking for now. I, I think it's the next step you agree with it? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I have a question regarding IAC. Do you treat them only one drug or have you one drug? Okay. Very good question. Very good question because we treat as uh, when we as first first uh, uh, IC we do single drug it's just methanol okay and we have um, observed that like uh, something like twelve percent of the patients develop a resistance to methanol or recur at the end of the three cycles and then. We switch. We, there's another protocol for relapse or resistance, and we give two drugs, and we give um, methanol same dose as the prescribed dose for the first courses, and we add two milligram. It's a lot because if you see the protocols, the other protocols, it's varying between 0.1 milligram 
to 0 0.4 milligrams. We do, we inject, irrespective to the weight of the child, the malfalan is according to the weight, but the malfalan, the topotecan inject 2 milligrams. So it's injected in a row in the same, during the same session, and uh, over, or also over 30 minutes, not more, because we don't want to stay more than 30 minutes in the, in the artery. And surprisingly, it's just amazing, it's like more than 90% uh, success. Maybe you can also maybe just repeat the method, I don't know. But very, but I, I think, I think the Topotecan does something definitely, you know, why I'm thinking this is because I have patients who recurred, you know, they responded partially after the first injection of methanol, and then as we were uh, going for the second, they, they were going to check just before, they recurred. There was a regrowth <laughs> under the treatment and responded perfectly well to the combination. So I think there is a really <coughs> Very, very efficient. But Francis, you said your first course of Malfalan is Malfalan only. Only. And for recurrence, you had to. We, we had to protect them, yes. So my next question is how did you arrive at 2 milligrams for every eye? Because of you. You can. Because, well, of because you. we said you could. Yes. Okay. You said. said you said. said <laughs> when I came, I, I, I came to visit you in Toronto, yes, yes, yes. you were injecting 2 milligrams per yes. reoccurrence. Yes. So I did that for quite a while. Yes. With uh, no some toxicity. success, no toxicity, yeah. and some success. Good. And <clears throat> we decided to inject 2 milligrams in the Good. Thank no, you. No, Good. Good. Because it works. It's okay. amazing how little toxicity. From Topotecan, I think it's slightly, I have to go back to this yeah, result. Yeah. We, we are preparing also a paper on that, but yeah. you know it's only 10-12% of the cases, so we have I think <coughs> like 12 or 13 patients who went through this, and we have only one enucleation in this in the subgroup. <coughs> No, 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 we haven't <coughs> tried it yet. But I think it's also a good question because carboplatin. So typically they inject 20 yeah. uh, milligram of carboplatin. Uh, the centers will use carboplatin. I think uh, maybe it will uh, open uh, a new, a new uh, area because we can think about injecting bilaterally. Methanol on one side and carbon on the other. Because you cannot inject methanol in both, both eyes. You end up with uh, too, too much, too, too, it's too high the dose, and I think toxicity is, is really. You, you, you lose the benefit of, uh, of an in situ uh, use of methanol, which is so toxic. So I, I think maybe in the future, I don't know, we, we can imagine injecting carbon in one eye and, and methanol in, in the same session. We had, as you said, at the scene, we had several bilateral injections of methanol, but it was not in the same session. We had one week apart. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But in the future, maybe we can do it in the same session, carbon one side, methanol the other side. But, but I would expect, I would be much more worried about the t toxicity to normal tissues in the eye of carbon. Yes. It's so toxic. In, in tissue, any tissue. I have no experience with carbon. So carbon in the orbit is usually Yeah, toxic. we know, we know. And so it, and anywhere it comes out, it's very toxic. So right. it's going to have similar effects. Yeah. I would anticipate the eyes of a I have experience with, right. with uh, periocular carbon, which was terrible. It's terrible. Terrible. It's terrible. Yes. So I need to be, you know, I think one case and I stopped. Yes. yes. And, um, but you're right. But I have no experience with uh, interrupted. I haven't heard any report of, of local toxicity, but it's just missing information, you know. I don't. So, Dr. Francis, uh, I have a question. Uh, so, your next dose of protein is for 2 milligram, right? So, of and course. Do the patient have the toxicity of this dose? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. We don't see a big, as far as I remember, I have to go back really of the real data to, 
to tell you exactly the toxicity, the grade of toxicity we have observed with and without. Because we have all the data from the same patients. I don't remember, honestly. But I, what I do know is that we haven't uh, faced any toxicity problem, serious toxicity problem with this patient. It was like, you know, the usual uh, uh, single dose uh, procedure. So it's again, it, we go again for a, a, a three cycles uh -huh. with a combination of the two drugs. But again, if at least based on this small series of 12 or 13 cases, uh, the, the mean number is less than three. Because we, you can stop before. Sometimes one shot of the combinations. Mm -hmm. <coughs> The tumor wiped out, mm -hmm. and so when you see, you don't see anything left, okay, you you um, keen to give a consolidation mm -hmm. at least a second dose, but uh, we we don't go for three doses, three injections in all the cases. But the protocol is three, up to three. Yeah. Uh, did you try to do sort of one milligram and did you compare compare the? No, we we give two. Uh, Maybe there was one of the 12 or 13 patients who received slightly less because it was less than six months of age. But um, uh, normally we give two. Uh, okay, so now I would. Yeah, please. Uh, do you, uh, have you uh, tried uh, only these uh, toxic uh, not No. No, we haven't tried. Uh, so, what you're saying is. Just to use the project, you say it's yeah. So yeah, I think there is. Uh, I'm not sure there is a very convincing evidence of uh, uh, anti-tumor effect of tocotecan alone in, in retinal astoma. We we know we know uh, there is allegedly a synergic synergic effect with uh, melphalan. So it makes sense to combine these two drugs, but uh, I think we don't have the information. Maybe someone, somebody has information in the room, but I don't have it. There is evidence to show that medical has the maximum yeah. Yeah. against retinal yeah. and the only reason it would not be used systemically was because of the switch now to intravitreal. <coughs> so uh, I will just present you my, I just re revised, I reviewed all my injection, uh, my patient injected for, for vitreal disease and uh, I was trying to, to look at could I find a, a risk factor for toxicity and how to uh, also to, to prevent this toxicity if possible. <coughs> So it's a retrospective review of all the patients treated with intravitreal in Lausanne between September 2009 and August 2016 and <coughs> presence or absence and grading of retinopathy uh, in these patients. So I remind the, the, the classification, uh, grade 1 toxicity is a retinopathy, a salt and pepper retinopathy at the site, actually around the site of uh, injection, less up to two quarters le uh, of uh, clock hours, up to two clock hours. Grade two is always uh, anterior retinopathy, <coughs> anterior to the equator, but more than two clock hours. Grade three would be a uh, toxicity that 
you know, affect uh, the retina posterior to the equator, but not touching the posterior pole. Grade 4, you will have, at this time, you have maculopathy, and grade 5, you have even uh, optic, optic neuropathy, because it's a pan retinopathy. So I just illustrate this with a few uh, <coughs> images. So this is, would be grade 1, uh, up to 2 clock hours. Grade 2, more than 2 clock hours. Grade 3, Posterior to the equator, grade 4, you have definitely an aculopathy. And grade 5, you have, you know, the retina is wiped out, there is even an optic atrophy. So, uh, I reviewed. Uh, that, that's just intravitreal without intraarterial. Oh, uh, no. Some have received also intraarterial at the same time. Uh, I haven't uh, analyzed the data um, to uh, isolate, yeah. uh, but we would say it. it's fairly straightforward because when you have the, 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 the occlusive uh, choreopathy, vascular choreopathy, it's, 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 another, it's another picture, yes. clinical yes. picture. Yes. So I think you can differentiate. Yes. The, so, in total, I, I had uh, 97 consecutive patients, uh, uh, 32 eyes were, were treated. In 25 of those, there was a pre existing scar at the site on purpose. You know, I, I chose this, this uh, meridian because there was a scar already. Uh, so, I, I cannot say it would have developed or not retinopathy. In the 77 uh, remaining patients, 56% did, did not develop sign of retinopathy at all. So 43. And 34, so 44% <coughs> developed a solid type of retinopathy. So now I started to analyze this uh, to see if I can identify you know, a risk factor. So it was quite disappointing because I couldn't find any significant difference in based I based on our treatment characteristics between the two groups. So especially if I take the mean number of injection, you know, if you have it, I never observed myself grade 4 and 5. The picture I've shown you are, are from, uh, from uh, elsewhere. So, you know, if you have no retinopathy, these have received a mean number of 4 injections, grade 2, 4.3, but there is no, no trend. <clears throat> it's not significant at all. If I take the mean dosage per injection, you see it's it's over over 20, um, because my range is between 20 and 40, and <clears throat> there is nothing also clearly uh, identifiable. Avec <laughs> The mean what? Ah, okay. Uh, good question. It was actually A, B, C, D, and I now oh, that just to, to have uh, something I can, uh, can plot. <laughs> yeah. So now, uh, if I look at the cumulative dose of melphalan, you see it's not a big difference between these grade 1, 2, and 3. Slightly more in the group grade 3. But it's very compa comparable uh, uh, with those with no, no retinopathy at all. It's not significant at all. Interestingly, the retinopathy will <coughs> be visible very, very early in the course of, of the treatment. In more than 80% of the cases, you have the retinopathy visible within two weeks from initiation of the treatment. And you know, all, for example, all the grade 3, they were all already visible after one injection. As I was doing the second, it was already there. So you will see, provided that you don't inject at a different entry site, there is no progression of the, of the retinopathy. But the grade seems to work. 
Mm -hmm. You know, oh, no. okay. the vast majority, you know, they appear to drive uh, 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 the belief. Yeah. So, to uh, sum up, uh, this written body is an abrupt, has an abrupt presentation, usually following the first or the second injection. It's uh, irreversible and uh, uh, non-progressive rather than vascular toxicity. I refer you to the, this paper of uh, uh, Yasmin Francis from, from New York, uh, who has also done a, a preclinical studies on, on this uh, toxicity in the, in the rabbit. It looks like it's dose independent, at least in the range of uh, doses administrated. Uh, I don't go over 40 and uh, I don't have more toxicity if I inject 20 or 40 years. It looks like independent of the dose. And I think what is left, I think it's very much dependent on the technique. Because most of the, the, the grade 4 and 5 uh, toxicity I've uh, seen, uh, I was contacted by, by others to, to and I think it's due to the technique, uh, mostly. So, I will end after this slide with my recommendations, but I think there is something very, very important to do before performing the first injection, is to do just a 12 MHz ultrasound. To look where is the posterior yellowing. You know, I showed this to my colleague, my colleague, uh, retinal surgeon colleagues, adult colleagues, they said, it's not possible uh, to have a uh, yellow detached at this age, but we know that the, the yellow is detached in most of our patients and those requiring uh, intravitreal, uh, the, I think the majority is detached and you see, it depends where this is <coughs> it depends where you, you put your, your needle, you can end up in the, in the retro yellow space, also if you use a short needle and if you inject in this space, you will have a toxic concentration for the retina and elicit the grade 4 and 5 toxicity. So I think it, I come up now with my, my recommendation for the technique. I think you have to perform this to, to you really you know, document the status of the prostate gallery. You have to perform a paracentesis. I recommend that it's so easy. I use a 34 gauge needle. There is no leakage. There is no complication. It's so easy. You do it under the microscope. It allows you to remove 0.1 milliliter or 0.2 milliliter <coughs> uh, That The same amount you will inject in vitreous. You have no hypertension, no reflux, and Importantly, it allows you to inject a higher injection, so a diluted melphalan. So it's not a high concentration that you inject, it's already diluted. And it spreads also into the vitreous cavity. It's a higher volume, so it spreads in, in, in the vitreous. And, and I think if you use a very high concentration, because you don't do the paracentesis, if you don't do the paracentesis, you're not able to inject more than 0.05 ml. Huh? It's impossible in a child's eye to inject more than 0.05. Uh, even doing so, you have a hypertension and a reflux. And if you do so, you have to use a very high concentration to, uh, to inject for 20 or 40 micrograms. <coughs> and I think you, you are at risk of uh, uh, more toxicity. Francis, where are your volumes that you choose, the volume that you would So I inject, inject. I inject always, the minimal volume I inject is 0 0.1 mm -hmm. when I have a 20 microgram injection because my dilution is 200 microgram per ml and I go up to 0 0.2 when I inject 40 microgram then to use a, 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 a long needle, 12 millimeter needle I use a 33 gauge needle myself. It's 
very tiny needle that uh, allows uh, uh, the injection. And I go 3 to 3.5 millimeter from the limbus, except in very young children, because uh, uh, I don't want to touch uh, the lens. And then I position the needle under the operating microscope, just behind the lens. So it's, it's, it's really nice because you can do that very accurately. If you have good, good dilation <coughs> conditions, you can do very accurately and be like less than one millimeter from the, the posterior uh, part of the lens. Um, so you eject very far from the eye wall. You're sure that you're not in the rotary light uh, gallery space. And what I observe injecting now, I've asked my, my uh, pharmacist to put a little of fluorescein in the mephalon. So I can visualize better where I inject. Because you want to see, normally if you inject, you see that there's a little cloud of, of melphalan uh, that appears. And is, is there, if upon injection you don't see where your, your, your injection goes, it means that either you are in a cavity or vitreous, Think about the Crockett's fat canal, think about the systems, think about the yellow uh, the level of it. So you have to, to go very carefully and precisely. Just on that, when you showed the first ultrasound, showing where the bit was. Yes. <coughs> so you're injecting here. Right here. Oops, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I inject right here. Yes. So, yeah. yes, so what's your theory? This That would diffuse through this yeah. nucleus. So it, but the tumor is over there. The tumor is here. It will, it, will, it, will, it will just be a slow release. Slow release. Here, but not in contact with the, with the retina uh, 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 mm -hmm. at the time of, of the injection. Have and there studies in an animal to say how, how slow it releases and how compared to its, because it's a chemical. Decreases yeah, we know that the half time of methadone in vitreous is 1.4 hour from uh, again Paula's work. Yes. So it's a very short uh, yeah. exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it would be nice to have a study that also said within that 1.4 hours it moves out. Yeah. Uh, but what I can say is doing so, you know, it, you know, it works. It works. <laughs> I can have seeds, epiretinal seeds, retroretinal, but epiretinal. Okay, thank you for coming back to the newborn. Yeah. Um, what's the point of that? Newborn hasn't had treatment for the mustoma. It has tiny tumors. Presumably that vitreous will be more complete. Yeah. In the, in the, in the, Except for the vitreous <coughs> canal. So, yes. So it's it maybe so the delivery check. the delivery to the to a channel will be more straightforward. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Except for the focus canal, yeah. quite right to yeah. just yeah. interesting. Um, when you change the injection to be a red, I still shake the eye. I still shake the eye. And how quickly do you get the baby up from lying down? So that the just stop. So uh, it's something that I don't uh, pay, attention. pay attention, but it's a good point. Yeah. It's a good point, especially considering mm -hmm. yes. Tero's experience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, okay. So if you can choose, prefer a meridian where you have a, a scar from the treatment of a, of, of a tumor, because you will avoid toxicity there, and. As you have to re you know, it's just one single procedure. I think it's important to use exactly the same meridian uh, to prevent extension of the retinopathy and shake the eye.